let us face without panic the reality of our time the fact that atom bombs may someday be dropped on our cities gotten interested in some of the Cold War infrastructure that was in the Twin Cities and uh, was interested in, in what parts were still around and what parts were still visible and the Nagy missile sites came up uh, over the course of my research and I, I thought it'd be a, a good subject for a column. So we are in St. Bonnie and we are near Missile Park which is where there is a marker uh, to the Nike missile base that had been located very near here um, during the earliest parts of the Cold War. Uh, in the early days of the Cold War, if a nuclear war was to break out between the Soviet Union and the United States, nuclear weapons would have to be delivered the old-fashioned way. You would have to get them in a plane and fly them over the North Pole and actually fly over the cities that you were going to bomb. When the defense schemes were, were being put together in the 1950s, um, one of the earliest missile defense plans was to actually place these Nike missile bases uh, on the perimeter of major American cities so that if the Soviet bombers got over the North Pole and they hadn't been shot down uh, over that or over Canada, the last resort was you would have to have these missiles come out of the ground and shoot the planes down very close to their final targets. Hand yourself right and you've got a good chance of coming through. Do the wrong things and you've got a future like an ice cube and a hot toddy. During the early part of the 1950s, this was a period when the U.S. government was telling everybody that it's possible to survive a nuclear war. Learn and live. If we got a word ahead of time, we could protect ourselves. But in order to get that word, to know that the Soviets were coming for us, we had to have a system in place. One of those systems was a pretty extensive radar uh, system across the United States, but there were holes in it. So there needed to be sort of a backup. What they created were the Ground Observer Corps, which are basically civilian volunteers who would go up, usually on the roofs of buildings, into bell towers, wherever, with their binoculars and just scan the skies uh, looking for Soviet aircraft on their way to their targets. It appeared to me that Minnesota was probably at the top, or at the very least, near the top of the per capita volunteering that was done uh, for the GOC, the Ground Observer Corps. With the knowledge of the first atomic explosions to guide us, our chances for survival will be far better than those of the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Many school districts across the country developed preparedness pamphlets and guidelines for what to do in the event of an emergency, and the emergency was the possibility of an atomic attack. And that was true here, too, in Minnesota, where a manual was developed to train children and their families what children should do to protect themselves. Yes, the knowledge is ours, and preparation can mean survival for you. Starting about 1953, after the Soviet hydrogen bomb test, the new emphasis was evacuating the cities, and to get ready for that, they, uh, the U.S. government started scheduling these annual test runs, basically, where they would act as if the Soviets were attacking us. The fact of the matter was, even if we're able to evacuate thousands of people out of the Twin Cities metro area, there's still gonna be thousands more who aren't gonna make it. The Soviet missile development program reveals that it introduces a new dimension to surprise and forces us to reassess our own strategic position and reevaluate the Soviet's ability to deal a crippling blow. In 1957, the Soviets uh, tested the first intercontinental ballistic missile. So now we know the Soviets have this technology 
that theoretically you put a bomb on top of one of these missiles, it can get to the United States, it can get to Minnesota in a matter of minutes instead of taking several hours for a bomber to get from the Soviet Union to wherever it was going. And so the government started concentrating instead on creating what they called fallout shelters. The shelter markings on the buildings in our cities and towns are symbols of an ever-expanding civil defense effort. So more and more Americans just started rejecting this idea that civil defense has any real role to play in keeping ourselves safe. And what happened was in Minnesota and other states, the civil defense uh, agencies sort of converted to think about natural disasters instead of these man-made, let's throw bombs at each other disasters. You know, if you see a blast, dive under your table. If you see a blast, it's too late, <laughs> you know? And that was pretty obvious to everybody. And so civil defense measures were on one level useless and on another level terrifying. So I think there are two alleged purposes to protect people and ease fears did exactly the opposite. The kind of setup like this, where you would have bombers flying over and dropping nuclear weapons and being shot down by missiles, you know, 30 minutes outside the Twin Cities, is certainly a part of the past. The Cold War is over, obviously, but um, the, you know, the threat of a nuclear annihilation is is not a part of history. That is a part of the present that we live in. So I think anything that reminds people that hey, this isn't just history. This is something that is still going on in some form is an important thing for people to keep in mind.